uh, and now we've got 11 through 20 lined up. So for 11, you're basically doing a qualitative analysis of group 1 cations, and those are Ag+, Pb2+, and Hg22+. And what these have in common is that they precipitate Cl-. So basically how you would separate them is that PbCl2 is much, much, more, much more soluble than AgCl or Hg2Cl2. So what you do is, if you know that like one of the three or two of the three or I guess all of them are in solution, you heat the solution up, and if the like if there's obviously a lessened amount of precipitate, like if the solution clears up a little bit, then you know Pb2 plus was in there, and uh, you can like decant and like filter stuff off and like once you separate the pb2 plus stuff from the other stuff uh, you can add ammonia to uh, the other stuff and if the solution just completely clears up then you know that there was only ag plus uh because ag plus uh complexes with ammonia to form the diamine silver ion i think that's how you say it but that would be really soluble and so it'd be clear but if there's only uh, mercury 2 2 plus then you would get some like grayish liquid thing it's like a mixture of black uh, liquid mercury and like some white precipitate that it makes but anyways that's how you'd like differentiate and if both silver and mercury would in there if they both were in there you'd kind of get like a mix of the results so you try to filter off the uh, silver containing stuff and then you'd add nitric acid in order to uh, break the complex and re-precipitate the AgCl just to make sure that you actually have Ag plus by itself. But anyways, uh, not all of what I just said is relevant to this question by itself. This question only talks about heating the stuff, and like I said, the only heat-dependent step here is separating Pb2 plus. So that's why we get 2 only for 11. Uh, for 12, you can start off by eliminating HF because it experiences hydrogen bonding, which is relatively strong uh, denomination of dipole-dipole attractions. Um, so that, yeah, you can get rid of it because stronger intermolecular forces means a higher boiling point, and we're looking for the weakest intermolecular uh, interactions here. Uh, I chose HCl because it has the least uh, prominent London dispersion forces here because its molar mass is the lowest, so it has uh, a lesser number of electrons total. Smaller electron cloud is less polarizable. Uh, so yeah, uh, the reason that dipole-dipole, like other than hydrogen bonding, doesn't really factor into this when you make your decision is that uh, all of these compounds are hydrogen bonded to some halogen. Halogens are relatively similar in their electronegativities, so there's not going to be that much of a difference in the polarity of any of the compounds. A uh, 13, what leads to an increase in the vapor pressure? So if we look at two first, adding a non-volatile solute it actually increases the Gibbs free energy. Uh, well, I'll back up. It increases the entropy of the solution because there's more states of matter within it. So that would decrease the Gibbs free energy. Uh, I mixed up my words before. It decreases the Gibbs free energy of the solution, so it makes it more favorable for the solution to stay as a solution rather than to vaporize. So that means plus vapor in the air, lower vapor pressure. That's the opposite of what we're looking for. We're looking for an increase in the vapor pressure. So we look at number one, increasing the temperature adds kinetic energy to the molecules of the solution. They become more excited. They become more likely to break away from their attractions to each other and go into the air. So that increases vapor pressure. Number 14. Okay, so this is a simple distillation setup. Uh, you're basically, you have two or more things in the flask on the left that you want to separate, and you can do this really easily because their boiling points are super far apart. You don't want them to be close together just in case they boil like simultaneously or something. You want one to boil by itself, and then the other to just be left in the left flask. So here we're boiling CHCl3. So we're applying the flame source or the heat source to point A, and that has to be above 61 degrees Celsius, just so we know that we actually boiled all of the CHCl3. Obviously, we can't get too close to 146 Celsius because we don't want to boil anything but CHCl3. But we have to get like decently far above 61 degrees Celsius. Uh, 
At C and D, the CHCl3 are already liquid, and if it's liquid, it can't be above or even near the boiling point. So it would be less than 61 degrees Celsius at C and D, which leaves B. Because in B, it's kind of in a transition from gas to liquid, which is about 61 degrees. Okay, so enthalpy of vaporization and fusion. Uh, okay, at the moment, I can't remember whether enthalpy of fusion is going from solid to liquid or liquid to solid, but that doesn't matter because it's only about the magnitude of the change, uh, not the sign or the direction. So here, if you can think about like a solid as the molecules just being really rigidly held, like they can only vibrate in place, and then a liquid is like slightly less rigid, they're moving around, but they're still held in place by the shape of their container, gases can do whatever they want. So if you consider going from a liquid to a solid, or I mix that up, a liquid to a gas as going to like medio mediocre rigidity to like full freedom, and a solid to a liquid as really rigid to like not that rigid but kind of rigid, going from kind of rigid to free is a lot bigger of a change than really rigid to kind of rigid. So that's why your enthalpy of vaporization would be greater than your enthalpy of fusion. And now that I think about it, I'm pretty sure that fusion is solid to liquid. Because it, it should be synonymous with melting. I'm just not 100% sure. Uh, okay, so for 16, all you have to do is proportions. It's like 398.15 is uh, 125 Celsius and 298.15 is... Uh, 25 celsius and this gets you 1.3 something something uh and that's how much your pressure needs to increase by because if we look at the ideal gas equation pressure and moles are on oh wh why am i saying moles pressure and temperature are in different sizes of the equation so they're proportional to each other so if temperature is going to increase by this factor pressure needs to as well one times anything is just whatever you multiplied it by, so it's 1.3 atms. Diamond is an example of what's solid. Um, you should probably just know this. It's network copium. Okay, 18. So I guess this is the first time I'm showing my Atkins notes. I just went through and like I took notes of Atkins. But basically, if we look at what the first law of thermodynamics is, it means that the internal energy of an isolated system must stay constant. So in other words, delta U is zero. Uh, when you determine a system is isolated, there's no outside stressors. So here it says delta U, but sometimes it's described as delta E, uh, as the USNCO does. So if we just look for an equation that looks similar to that, then we find that B is our answer. 19. Okay, so this method of like counting... Uh, I guess like atom amounts in a unit cell is really helpful uh, whenever you're given like a diagram like this. So any atom that's just directly in the middle of a unit cell counts as one because it only belongs to that unit cell and no other unit cell. Any So that, that would be like this colored thing or dotted thing, not colored thing. A a anything like this dark sphere that lies on a corner or a vertex, it counts as one eighth because it's shared between eight different unit cells. Because if you can imagine like eight spheres stacked up against each other, they all share that sphere of that one corner. Anything on an edge is one fourth, uh, because once again, it's shared by four unit cells. Uh, we don't have anything on the middle of a face, I don't think, but like if anything was like right here in the middle of a face, that would count as one half because it lies shared between two different unit cells. So if we do a quick count, we have one center thing, so that counts as one. We have eight vert vertices, so eight times one eighth. Then we have uh, four, four, I think I'm pretty sure that's 12 uh, edge pieces. So if we add that up, that's two, three, five. Uh, but we have to pay attention to what the question is asking, and this relates to A, this relates to B, this relates to C. So we have 1A, one 1B, one 3C, so that's A, B, C, 3. So number 20, 
Okay, so ignore the whole enthalpy part. We're just writing the reaction of the formation of NaOH. So any formation reactions, we're only making one mole of the thing, and we're only using the constituent elements uh, in their form that they would be found in nature. So if we're talking about hydrogen, that's H2. If we're talking about uh, iron, that would be Fe solid. Uh, when I said H2, I mean H2 gas, because that's how it would be found in nature. So we look for any exceptions to that rule. We have Na plus here. That's not an element found in its natural state. We have hydrogen peroxide here. That's not. We have water here. So we're only left with B. And if you think these one halves are weird, I agree, but they're a necessity when you have to use dimolecular uh, substances on on the reactant side and you only have an odd number on the right side. So they're a necessity. Uh, don't get freaked out by them. All right, so next time we'll go over 21 through 30.